The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 13 She was the last. Kemper had vanished. He'd gone with her up to the farmhouse and just disappeared. When she saw him again, it was a few hours later in the horrifying form of a death mask. Andy had also been lost up at the Hewitt place. Aaron couldn't be sure, but she thought she'd heard him get cut up by the chainsaw. Either way, he never came back. Pepper she'd seen for herself. She saw how that bastard churned up her insides and wore them like freaking body lotion. Only Morgan had got away, and he'd been arrested, which was kind of ironic. Which just left Aaron. And even she had no idea how truly alone she was. Liquid was splashing down onto her face. It was lukewarm and it stung her eyes. Some of it burned the tiny cuts on her lips and surged forward into her mouth, causing her to choke. She coughed and began to heave up from the abyss of a deep sleep, shocked awake by the fluid poured all over her. She was lying on her back. And then there was the light. At first it hurt her eyes, so she blinked and raised her hands to shield them. But someone kept knocking her arms away, making sure that her head got thoroughly soaked. Gradually, she began to see that she was staring up at a large rotating fan, set in the middle of a water-stained ceiling high above. She couldn't feel any draft from the fan, only the damn splashing liquid. She spat some of the liquid back out and tried to move her head out of the way. It was killing her eyes and it stank. It was bourbon. Someone was pouring liquor all over her face. And suddenly the memories of the day came rushing back, depriving her of the reassuring ignorance of sleep. Almost immediately she knew she wasn't in the trailer anymore. The ceiling was too high and... Jedediah's face popped into view. She's alive, he called out, a wide smile on his face. Grandma, she alive. The boy was pushed aside and suddenly Aaron's view was full of Sheriff Hoyt, laughing and pouring bourbon all over her face. She cried out. Give her some room, said a voice from somewhere off to the side. It was a voice Aaron recognized, a grating old woman's voice. The sheriff sneered and spilled one last dash of stinging booze into Aaron's left eye before stepping away. Aaron struggled to make sense of it all. Where the hell was she? What was the boy doing here and why was the sheriff? Her fear knew all the answers even before she did. Aaron barely had time to articulate even a fraction of all the questions running through her mind, when suddenly she knew where she was. No longer under the influence of the drug put in her tea by Henry Etta, Erin nevertheless felt dazed and confused as she sat up and looked all around the living room of the Hewitt house. They were all here, all of them, the whole damn town. Jedediah stood to the side and watched her excitedly. He was holding the baby from the trailer and so he should. It was his little sister. But what the hell were they both doing here? Had Jedediah hooked up with these crazy bastards? Didn't he care that they killed his parents? Then she saw the sheriff. Sheriff fucking Hoyt. The sadistic backwater cop was a cliché in his own uniform. At least Aaron now understood how the Hewitts had been getting away with it all for so long. There was no way they could have hidden all those wrecked cars out in that clearing all these years without at least someone becoming suspicious. And all the reports of missing people that must have come through here? Hoyt probably wiped his ass with them. Henrietta was nowhere around, but the fact that the baby was here meant she must be someplace nearby. And finally, that voice, the voice that had told the sheriff to give Aaron some room. 
Aaron turned around and saw Luda May sitting across the room from her in an armchair, almost the last piece of the jigsaw. Suddenly, Aaron understood the game they'd all been playing. From the moment Luda May had sent the van up to Crawford Mill, Aaron and her friends had been delayed, confused, separated, and slaughtered. In a couple of days, a little witch would be selling their clothes, luggage, and their fucking auto parts down at the fucking store. The ruthless old bitch. Just beyond Luda May's chair was an open doorway into another room. There was a TV on, and she could see old Monty watching it. The show had a laugh track, but Monty looked as miserable as sin. He reached down and scratched his nuts, parting his knee stump, thighs to make sure he got his fingers in the crevice good and proper. Suddenly, she tensed. Where was... One person was still missing. The freak Aaron hoped never to see again in her life. Where was he? And why had Henrietta brought her here? What did they want? Dumb question. Aaron knew what they wanted. They wanted her dead. Only they had no intention of getting it over with quickly. If they simply wanted to kill her, they could easily have slit her throat or shot her while she was drugged, but no, that was too quick for them, too clean. From what she'd seen so far, the way it had all been drawn out, these hillbilly bastards got off on fear and intimidation. It wasn't just about meat or death, it was also about abuse and the sheer extremities of gratuitous terror. Aaron wiped her face and blew her nose, trying to clear away the liquor. She could see the sheriff watching her, eyeing her, checking her over. Morgan! If the sheriff was here, where was Morgan? The last Aaron had seen of her friend was when the sheriff had arrested and taken him away in the squad car. Was Morgan here as well? And would she ever find out what had happened to Andy and Kemp... Kemper? Oh, God! The face! He'd been wearing Kemper's face while butchering Pepper's remains. Suddenly, Aaron was shaking. Snot dripped over her lips and tears began to fill her eyes. She looked across at Luda May, but the old woman stared right back at her like she was nothing more than a bobcat turd. And yet, when Luda May had told Hoyt to move away from Aaron, the broad-necked sheriff had done so, almost as if the old woman was in charge. Maybe Aaron could... Please! The girl begged. I'm... I'm pregnant. Perhaps she could connect with Luda May in some way, woman to woman. Maybe she could get her to feel some sympathy or anything. But the old woman was having none of it. I know you and your kind, she spat. You never had nothing but cruelty and ridicule for our son, and even here you don't leave him alone. She raised a gnarled fist and began to pound on her own sternum. Does anybody around here care about me and my son, huh? Her son... That was it. They were all family. Old Monty and Luda May were man and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Hewitt, and the sideshow killer was their son, which could have made Henrietta their daughter. Aaron remembered seeing the photographs of Henrietta standing with the boy before and after his debilitating facial condition. Aaron wasn't sure where Sheriff Hoyt belonged, but she was sure of one thing. There was no way on God's good earth that either Henrietta or her psychopathic freak of a brother was ever going to have a family. So if nothing else ever happened to these bastards, they'd at least die of old age and take their sick mental disease with them. Please, in ma called Jedediah. she got a baby inside her. The boy was actually trying to help, but what he said almost tore Aaron apart. Suddenly, she realized that Jedediah and the baby were the future of the Hewitt family. They'd raise the kids up to be as perverted and evil as them. They'd probably even get Jedediah to fuck his younger sister, just to make sure there'd be more little Hewitts on the way. Still sitting on the floor, Aaron looked pleadingly at the boy, and she began to cry hard. Partly, she was crying for herself, and partly, she was crying for what Jedediah was going to become. Even his name... What Californian kid would choose such an old-fashioned, Bible-thumping name? Somehow this madness had to end. Jedediah watched her sob, but there was no expression on his face other than enthusiasm for Aaron's pregnancy. What if it's a boy, he said out loud. I, I could have me a brother. Aaron sank, 
her head dropping to see that Jedediah was wearing mismatched shoes. The left shoe, in particular, was way too large for his foot because it came from Andy. You just forget about that right quick, Luda May warned the boy. The chilling implication was obvious. Aaron's pregnancy was never going to happen. Both the girl and the baby were going to be terminated, the old-fashioned way. Jedediah bawled and then ran crying out of the room. But Aaron only had eyes for the left shoe, the one he'd stolen from Andy. Everyone she'd spoken to, everything she'd seen and heard, everywhere she'd looked all day long, Aaron had been staring into the dripping sores of madness. The commotion was getting to him. Too much had been happening around the house these last few days. He shuffled about the room in tight, disordered circles, his breath ruffled and distorted by the loose skin flaps of Kemper's lips. His bedroom was next door to the living room, and he could hear them all talking and shouting through the wall because it was cracked. He was cracked, and he wanted it to stop. He had things to do, and he wanted to do them to the girl. He'd placed an eye up to a small crumbling hole in the wall and panted at Aaron in the living room. Aaron didn't know what they wanted from her. Luda May just stared while the sheriff started to grab at her and shove her around. She didn't dare move or get up. She just sat there on the living room floor with her legs stretched out in front of her, but it was getting too much. The insanity of it all, the unbearable tension waiting for the moment when the whole situation would turn on the head of a pin, constantly skating close to the edge of violence that was sure to happen. Finally, she snapped. What's wrong with you fucking people? She cried. She just couldn't take it anymore. Sheriff Hoyt just sniggered, but Luda May shook her head disapprovingly. Those kids had shown they got no manners down at the store, but if they thought they could bring their dirty mouths into her own home, then she'd have to teach them otherwise. Tommy, she called. Thomas Brown Hewitt, come here now. Aaron wept. There was only one person Thomas Brown Hewitt could be. One person. No the footsteps came from just down the hallway. They were heavy, loud, and forceful, making the floorboards creak under the strain. Yet the steps were also fast and irregular, almost as if the person wasn't walking but having some kind of orgasmic fit. He was almost inside the room. Aaron could hear his breathing now, but she didn't want to look. She didn't want to see that mask made from Kemper's face. She didn't want to touch his blood-stained leather apron. She didn't want to be smothered by his rippling, murderous fat. She didn't want those hands to touch her breasts. She didn't want the smell or the rotting teeth, and, oh God, she didn't want him to kill her. Leatherface hurled his massive, quivering frame in through the open doorway and stamped his feet all around the young woman crying on the floor. Luda May got up and pushed the ugly bastard right at Aaron. Get her out of my sight, she said disgustedly, and then the dam broke. His hands were suddenly all over her, grabbing, pulling, tugging, and gripping. She could feel his rank breath on her face, and she could have died each time she heard him rant and squeal from inside Kemper's face. His thumb accidentally caught her in the eye, jabbing her with a long, dirty nail caked in corpse shit. Just like Kemper, Andy, and many others before her, Aaron found there was nothing at all she could do to stop Leatherface misusing her. Despite all her kicking, punching, and screaming, he dragged her out of the living room like an old sack of potatoes, and the full horror of her ordeal returned to her. No longer could she pretend that it wasn't real. 
She couldn't hide in Henrietta's trailer and somehow think that all the rules had changed. It was just like it was before, when she came here with Andy, and when the industrial sliding door had first fired open. Henrietta had talked about Leatherface like he was some kind of victim, and Luda May seemed to treat him like a no-good layabout son, but Thomas Brown Hewitt was screaming, fucking terror. No! Welled Aaron, but she was wasting her stupid breath. Soon she was out in the main hallway going right past the bathroom, where the old cripple had faked his fall, past the weird kitchen with its hanging strips of meat, and down towards, no, the sliding metal door. The door was already half open, revealing the sickly green maniac. But suddenly he shrieked, showering her face with spit, and slammed her up against the wall, pressing his body against hers, his apron of dried human skin scraping her bare arms and shoulders. She could feel tremors of excitement shaking through his fat as he crushed his twitching mass against her, screaming full on in her face before finally picking her up and hauling her right across his shoulders. She was helpless, her back on his back as he bulldozed down the hall and lugged her flailing limbs through the sliding door. She had no idea where he was taking her. When Leatherface stood at the top of the basement stairs and threw her over his head, down the long staircase, she couldn't even guess what was about to happen to her. At first, she was falling through midair, but when she finally hit the steps, the impact knocked all the wind out of her and suddenly her bones were crashing against wood and concrete in a whirlwind of uncontrolled descent. As she fell, her head cracked against the wall, leaving behind a mat of bloody hair, and it seemed as if something in her body would break at any moment. But when she finally crashed into the water-covered floor of the basement, she was amazed to find herself conscious and in one piece, and terrified. Ignoring the pains erupting all over her body, she rolled over onto her back, got up on all fours and moved, crab-like, away from the foot of the stairs. She splashed backwards through the filthy water, not knowing if he was going to be coming down after her or not. For the moment, adrenaline was masking the agony of her fall. She didn't seem to have broken any bones, but she was coming up in bruises and she definitely damaged some muscles. Suddenly, the whole house shook with a colossal booming of metal. It was a sound she'd heard before, when she'd been trapped in the bathroom with old Monty. She'd heard that same loud crash and had known something had gone wrong with Kemper. So she'd gone looking for him, only to draw a blank, right outside the sliding door. Crying with panic, she struggled to her feet and staggered over to the bottom of the stairs. She looked up. Hewitt wasn't there. But the metal door had been closed, and that's what she'd heard. Hard to believe it had been only a few hours ago, but that must have been when the Hewitts had taken Kemper. While Monty had kept her tied up in the bathroom, his son Leatherfuck must have gone out and killed Kemper. The murderous freak was probably bringing her boyfriend down here to the basement when she'd heard the door slam. Aaron cried. Ankle deep in shit water, Aaron cried as time passed. dried her eyes and began to feel just how banged up she was by the fall. Though she was lucky not to have broken a neck, she could easily have died in the way he just threw her over his shoulder like that, the bastard. Her clothes were soaking wet from the foul-smelling water on the floor, and she was bleeding, tired, and in shock. They'd locked her in the cellar of the Hewitt house, and if she was right about the sound of the metal door, then Kemper was down here as well. But Hewitt had skinned her boyfriend's face, so if Kemper was somewhere in the basement, what condition would he be in? How could he be the father of her child if he hadn't got a face? Would he have to wear a mask? 
Now, like Andy and Kemper before her, Erin took her first good look at the ramshackle deprivation of the slaughterhouse's basement. It was dark. There seemed to be a flickering light, a fire just around the corner. But most of the place was bathed in shadow, and there was so much insane clutter strewn all over the place that Erin found it hard to take any of it in. She closed her eyes, pushed her long hair back behind her ears, and tried to relax. She needed to pull herself together if she was going to search this place. She had to be ready for anything she might find. Anything. When she opened her eyes again, the first thing she noticed was how much stuff was up off the ground. Pipes, chains, hooks, pulleys, shelves with jars and tools of all kinds. The second thing that hit her was the smell, and she vomited, her puke splashing into the water around her feet, washing up against her calves. She raised a forearm up to her nose, but couldn't block it out. It smelt as if someone had taken a month-old dead cow and drowned it in its own putrescent shit. But all Aaron could do was get used to it. She thought she was going to puke a second time, but she hadn't eaten all day, so all she did was spasm, racking her already bruised and battered ribcage. A minute or two passed before she got it under control, and then she slowly stepped deeper into the basement. Up, down, left, right, her eyes flinched at the realization that she had just walked into an unholy butcher shop with strips of flesh, meat, bones, blood, and organs. The soiled butcher block crushed viscera and sweet dripping blood with needle and thread lying by the cleaver and knives. So many razor-sharp knives, the needle again attached to a length of fishing line, and the floor was awash with blood. She couldn't go on. She didn't want to know. There were buckets of blood standing on the floor, and nearby were sets of slaughter irons and meat hooks and bone scrapers and chopping blades covered in rust and stained with decades of murder. Lying on a rack were a series of precision blades, scalpels, delicate surgical bone saws, cold steel probes. There was nothing in this godforsaken pit that spoke of painless death. The basement squatted like a cancer at the heart of the Hewitt home, and every damn square inch of the place was a physical expression of the sick ingenuity at the core of Thomas Hewitt's depravity. Aaron stared with utter disbelief at a length of human intestine wrapped around the head of a sledgehammer and realized she may already be looking at what was left of her dead partner. It must have been Hewitt who had made all those revolting things they'd found back at the mill. She shuddered and drew her hands in close against her aching body. She didn't want to touch a single revolting thing, not even by accident. The basement had already cut a bleeding scar deep into her memory, and she was convinced that the entire nightmarish day was affecting her mind. How else could she function down here in this dejected murder hole? A gentle noise came from somewhere over to her left. Afraid, Aaron crept round to see a rumbling fire burning in a cast iron gate. There was a cauldron suspended over the flames, and above the cauldron hung some torn strips of meat nailed into a wooden beam. Melted fat ran down the pieces of dead flesh and collected in the sizzling pot, the whole thing oozing with meat grease and stinking like an infected pig. Despite the heat of the fire, Aaron shivered. In fact, she hadn't been able to keep her hands still since she woke up in the Hewitt living room and now she could hear another sound emanating from somewhere behind her, faint, bizarrely like a piano tapping notes, repetitive, tuneless, and discordant, almost like the unstructured practice notes of a brain-damaged child. It was a piano. Aaron turned to see where the sound was coming from. Oh my god! It was Andy. 
she wept uncontrollably, her hair, body, and clothes already soaked and lank from having earlier crawled along the wet basement floor. Her first thought was that he'd been crucified. He was hanging up in the air, his intact left leg dangling some three or four feet up above the ground. His shoulders seemed to be resting against a thick old pipe that ran just below the ceiling of the room, and his arms were fully outstretched, making it seem as if his hands had been nailed to the pipe. But as Aaron took a horrified step nearer, her tortured friend, she realized, oh God, she realized that he was hanging from a meat hook buried deep within his back. He'd pulled his arms back and rested them on the pipe in a desperate effort to try and take some of the weight to relieve his agony. And then, in the flickering light of the fire, Aaron registered the condition of Andy's left leg. His right leg was fine, though strangely barefoot. Suddenly, she remembered seeing Jedediah wearing his left shoe and the shoes for sale at Luda Mays. But his left leg, dear Christ, his left leg had been cut off below the knee and someone had taken the trouble to wrap the butchered stump in brown paper and twine to staunch the bleeding, which didn't make any sense to Aaron. Why bother to stop the bleeding unless... Andy's right foot twitched, and she heard another melodic tone. He was hanging over an old busted-up piano, the white keys thick with deep red blood, the black keys even blacker in the darkness of the basement. Each time his foot jerked spasmodically, he hit another note. Larger, heavier drops of blood and internal fluid also managed to get a sound from the delicate light keys. Aaron was hearing the young man's death march, not the tune played at his funeral, but the threnati that was a personal orchestration of his actual death. Notes performed in the very act of his dying. It was a hollow, edgy song for the murderers to dance to. But was the movement of his foot a nervous reflex, or... His eyes opened, not by much, but they opened. The boy had been hanging there on the meat hook for hours, and yet he was still alive. She could not begin to comprehend how he felt, the poor, poor bastard. Andy! He stared down at her. His eyes were vapid, filmy, and almost unable to see. They were the sharpest measure of the dwindling life force that remained within him. But he had seen her. Aaron could barely bring herself to look at him. It broke her heart. She'd known they must have got him, and part of her had wanted to know for sure what had happened to him, but she couldn't bear to see her friend like this. She couldn't bear to see anyone like this, except maybe those Hewitt bastards. Andy tried to talk, but nothing came out, save for a slight hiss of coagulated breath. All she could hear was the faint plinking of the piano. She wanted it to stop. Seizing her courage, Aaron hurried forward and grabbed hold of Andy's good leg in both her hands. Then she braced herself and lifted him up, hoping to help get him off the hook. She didn't know how badly injured he was. The boy looked pretty far gone, but she had to do something. Even if they couldn't get out of this place, at least she could try to relieve his pain, or give him some dignity. But the truth of the matter was that Aaron was thinking more and more about escape. It wasn't a rational thought. It wasn't based on any special plan or knowledge. No, her desire to break free was driven by the pure primal passion for revenge. She wanted to do everything she could to get out of there, save her friends, then see the Hewitts burn in hell. With each push and strain, Aaron tried. Andy cried out in pain. He could feel the sharp end of the hook twisting his vertebrae apart the temperate curved metal scraping new furrows in his guts. He could barely breathe. She tried again. He screamed. She twisted. He cried out. She gave up. The hook was buried too deep, and she just didn't have the strength. Maybe if she could actually reach the damn thing. Aaron saw a round stool standing next to a workbench. She quickly went to fetch it and didn't even pause when she saw that someone had nailed animal bones around the rim of the wooden seat. After what she'd seen today, a few broken bone sculptures really didn't bother her anymore. And that scared the fuck out of her. Was she becoming like them? No. No fucking way. She dragged the stool over and managed to get Andy to put his right foot on it. Again, the movement made him cry out. 
but once he was in position, he no longer felt his entire weight depending from the cruel barb gradually ripping upwards through his torso. The relief was immeasurable. Careful not to knock into him, Aaron stepped up onto the footrest of the stool and reached up for the hook sticking out of a dark crimson patch in the back of Andy's gray top. The rusty chain clattered as she took hold of it and slowly began to pull it out. Almost immediately, the basement echoed with the staccato notching of breaking vertebrae, followed by Andy's mournful wailing, an understated lowing that bespoke of a suffering most men never have to endure. Aaron's help was killing him. Quickly, she stopped. Blood was on her hands, but the hook was just as embedded as when she began. It was impossible. She tried again, but only succeeded in hurting him even more. Aaron had hoped. She'd really hoped to be able to help him. She thought she could get him down and then work out what they'd do next. But hope had been denied to her. She couldn't even get the damned hook from out of his back. It was just like the rest of this never-ending nightmare of a day. Offer hope and then take it the fuck away. She stepped back off the stool, her face streaked with the mud of dirt and tears. I'm sorry. She cried. He tried to cough, but it hurt too much. His vision was fading in and out, and his eyelids drooped as he tried once more to speak. What? She asked, leaning closer. I, I couldn't. Just like before, she couldn't hear a thing. Andy seemed to lose all energy. His chin dropped onto his chest, and his whole body went limp. But this was necessary. He had to pause to muster up enough strength to make sure that the next thing he said did not go unheard. Do it, he whispered. Sweat dripped from his hair and landed on her bare forearm. She looked at him, at Andy, her friend, Kemper's best buddy. She looked at Andy and died inside because she knew what he just asked her to do. There was only one thing he could mean. Do it. She couldn't get him down, lift him off the hook, or pull the bloody thing out of his back, which left only one alternative. Aaron could relieve his pain and give back some dignity the only way open to her. She could kill him. That's what he'd asked her to do. Kill him. Her mind went back to that sunny day on her school vacation when she'd found that orange tomcat hit by an automobile. Fine enough for mommy to talk about animal heaven, but the cat wasn't dead when Aaron found it. Half its head had been crushed, but it was still mewing and pawing, pleadingly at thin air. It was her daddy who put the thing out of its misery. He said it was for the best, so the cat had only got to animal heaven because her dad had sent it there. Tears stung her eyes, and she wondered if there were any pets in people heaven. Aaron had no trouble finding what she needed. There were cutting tools scattered everywhere about this death chamber, and in a moment she was holding the knife. The blade was long and thin. It ended in a cruel point and was slightly curved to ensure a good sweeping cut across the edge. Both the cracked wooden handle and the knife's corroded blade were encrusted with dried carnivorous remains, the tangible echoes of a thousand murdered screams. Aaron gripped the knife in both hands and held it up in front of her chest as she walked back to stand directly in front of the impelled victim. Her arms trembled, causing the blade to shake as she raised it above her head. She took a deep breath and froze. <laughs> I can't! She wept, and she began to lower the blade, unable to do what he'd asked of her. Aaron! Please! 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 He croaked. Desperation ripped his voice apart. He tried to open his eyes to look at her, to implore her. He arched his back, almost as if trying to throw himself forward onto the knife that she held before him. She couldn't leave him like this. He was her friend, but she couldn't kill him. If she did, how would she be any different from poor sweet little Tommy? Aaron was not a killer. She was human and it was her humanity that now had her gritting her teeth and struggling to fight back her tears. It was her compassion that made Aaron step back, look away, and then rush in towards him. And it was mercy that drove the knife into his chest, the hard blade breaking through the sternum and then pushing smoothly into the vulnerable soft tissue beneath. Yes, 
It was love that spilled tears onto Andy's chest as he died. Erin stood back and looked long and hard at what she'd just done. She prayed with all her heart that there really was a heaven. No man should end his days in such pain, fear, and despair. And she begged God to show mercy for what she had just done. And she wasn't even religious. Once the tears had almost subsided, Erin withdrew the knife from Andy's body. The feel of the blade sliding out through the neat pocket it had made in his moist, dead flesh made her feel sick. But she couldn't leave him like that. She couldn't just leave him to hang with the knife in his chest. Aaron looked at the blood on her hands. Had she just deprived Hewitt of another victim, or had she just saved him some time? She could never know what went on in that bastard aberration of a mind, no matter how far she fell. Andy had begged her. He begged. She thought she hadn't any tears left in her, but she was wrong. The basement lay in grim silence all around her stretching out into corners and alcoves, daring her to look further. Would she find a way out? Would she find a weapon she could use against Leatherface? Or would she discover something else that might quicken her descent into mental oblivion? Aaron looked at the knife in her hand. She knew she couldn't stop Hewitt that way. He was too big, too powerful, and if he used the chainsaw again... She was on the verge of dropping the knife when she heard the sound of someone moaning. Her first thought was that Andy had somehow survived being stabbed, but he couldn't have. One grudging look at the pallid corpse confirmed this. Andy was dead. Aaron shook her head. Maybe she was hearing things, or perhaps the noise was coming from upstairs. But then she heard it again, and this time there was no mistake. It was a moan, and it came from around the corner of the room. There was no doubt that she was hearing more pain. It sounded like a wounded animal. There were no half-words or human qualities to the whimpering at all. It was more like a beaten whine. Nevertheless, Aaron couldn't bear to witness any more scenes of raw brutality. She didn't care if it was a wild hog. She didn't want to find any living thing suffering the way Andy had suffered. And she didn't want to have to. No, she couldn't kill again. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 13 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake. Not a whole lot of action going on here, but we did get to see that Andy, you know, wasn't completely dead. Now he is. Hell of a situation that she found herself in there. And now she's hearing more noise. Is there somebody else down here? We're going to find out soon when I come back with Chapter 14 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hope you all enjoyed tonight's chapter. I know I did. <laughs> Phone's going off over here. Uh, I enjoyed tonight's chapter immensely. I'm really loving this book. Stephen Hinn did an amazing job. Uh, I love the way he describes the family and the thoughts that are going on in Aaron's head, even the thoughts going on in Leatherface's head. Again, sorry for the delay between uploads. Uh, it's going to get quicker and quicker as we go, I promise. I'll be back very soon with more of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. <laughs>